Um, just to show you some of the companies that we've worked with, um, including people like uh, Citibank in New York and the World Bank in Washington, um, D.C., uh, and Shell in its various guises. So you see, they are all rather large organizations, and we would never take on an entire organization of that size um, on as a whole. What we do do um, is we work with them in terms of identifying what we call natural experiments. By the way, you have both the a handout of the slide and you also have a paper with uh, more or less everything I'm going to say in, in the pack. Um, okay, what do we mean by a natural experiment? By a natural experiment, we don't mean an experiment in the sense that we are scientists and we want to conduct an experiment on an organization. That's just not on. A natural experiment is something that a part of the organization wants to do for themselves. They want to change. They want to explore alternatives. And this is what a natural experiment is. It's an experiment for them, not for us. I think that's very, very important to, to actually um, understand. And what we do with them is we do it on the basis of collaborative action research. Collaborative in the sense that we work very closely with um, our partners. And I think um, from what was said this morning, that ha I hope has come through quite clearly. We don't do things to them. We do not provide solutions that in our, our sort of dreamt up somewhere um, in the background, we actually work with them and in a process of co-creation. And action research is because we, we take a very active role um, in the organization. For example, we have um, um, attended several of the senior management team meetings. We've gone to one, a learning exchange conference um, and so on, and, and the same with, with Rolls-Royce. We have been very much part um, of the organization, obviously as far as it's feasible. Um, the action research means that um, we're actually having an effect on the organization quite distinctly, and working with the other ALD members in um, Rolls-Royce obviously had quite a significant effect, but it isn't one way. It is never one way. Our own methods actually changed by doing that, that project with, with the ALD. We had never anticipated such a thing at the beginning. When Terry came and offered the idea to me, um, I was sort of slightly taken aback and I said, wonderful, let's do it. Um, it's great, let's try it out. But it wasn't something we had ever anticipated and it did change. And also the way that, for example, we designed the two-day workshop, it wasn't just a research reflect back workshop. The one day we concentrated on the research, the second day it was very much using some of the tools that the organization was familiar with that they also wanted to explore. So there is constant reciprocal influence. That is what, how I term co-evolution, reciprocal influence that results in change on both entities that are interacting. And that is what very much happens. Um, now, <laughs> uh, just to keep you on your toes, um, be a little aggressive at the top. Yes, um, I'm afraid we do see, I mean, it, the organizations I named are just very few of the ones we've worked with. And what we do see is that they do feel much more comfortable with, 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 the, with um, restructuring as a top-down process, when in fact the whole logic of complexity argues for the exact opposite approach. Um, so it argues very much for creating an enabling environment, co-creating an enabling framework. And how we do that, we identify the social, the cultural, the technical, the political, the economic conditions that are necessary to facilitate whatever it is the organization wants to achieve. The work we've been doing with the core team, we've had three meetings with the core team working together. We took them through that process. It's astonishing what has come through that uh, process in the material that, that was uncovered. 
um, because it is, it is working very much, very closely uh, with what they know of their organization based on all the findings. So if you can imagine the wealth of findings and then on top of that their own experience, the thing is really quite rich. Um, so that is what we've been doing there. Okay, we see organizations as complex evolving systems. We do not <laughs> um, argue about whether organizations are or are, or are not. Uh, our underlying assumption, our basic assumption is that all human um, organizations are complex evolving um, systems and in a moment I will show you what I mean by the characteristics of um, that complex evolving <laughs> systems have um, and the methodology actually needs to be appropriate uh, to take those characteristics into account because if you don't um, appreciate, if you don't understand what coevolution means, what self-organization means, etc., etc., um, then it's, it, you are denying it. Also, tracking changes over time, as Yasir said earlier, um, ideally, NetMap needs to be done over time to look at the evolution of connectivity. Uh, and the same with the agent-based model. That, again, needs to be done over time. Um, and with, with the interviews, for example, with um, Rolls-Royce, we did do a second set of interviews, interviewing the interviewers. And, and Melissa will talk to you about that later, because that's very important to see how things evolve over time. They're never static, they're always changing. And of course, addressing qualitative and quantitative aspects. So that is why, one of the reasons why we have these different methods. They're not just qualitative, they're not just quantitative, they are both. Because organizations have both characteristics, we need to address both. And as well as the broader environment with, within which the organization is existing. If we only look at the organization, we're only doing part of the job. How is the organization um, in interacting with its broader social ecosystem. How can we facilitate, by the we, I don't mean us um, as researchers, I mean we including the organ, how can we facilitate the co-evolution with the changing environment? Because if we stuck on the idea that all you can do is restructure deliberately every six months or whatever some organizations are doing, you're wasting a hell of a lot of, of time, effort, morale. Um, if we can actually get this understanding, this complexity thinking embedded into the culture of the organization so that itself is continually looking at what is happening, recognizing the patterns and changing, um, you get uh, the... Uh, you know, the, the, the situation where the organization is continuously working alongside its environment, but not a one-way process. It's again a reciprocal process. It's influencing the environment and the environment is influencing it. It's a constant co-evolutionary process. I think it's very important. Now, these are some of the characteristics that you'll see on the right. It's self-organization. And then I've got four that I've grouped together. Emergence, connectivity, interdependence, and feedback. I've grouped those four together because we are very familiar with those from uh, systems theory. So those of you who are familiar with systems theory, these are already there. And people keep asking, what's the difference between systems and complexity? Well, the answer is, we build on it, we enrich it. It's much broader, much richer um, than systems theory. But these four are at the heart of both. Um, theories. But we also need to, to, to look at what does it mean to explore the space of possibilities. How do you facilitate it? This is where innovation comes from. This is where the new products, the new ideas, the new services will come from. How do you actually facilitate that exploration and not block it? And part of the argument, I remember when we were in the boardroom um, facing your president, and I think we discussed that in terms of explaining that, that, that what was happening was partially blocking this innovation of new products, it was, um, it, it was very clear that that needed to be done. Um, and then things like historicity and time, what does that mean? It means actually res um, respecting the history, the culture of the organization. You cannot have a blank 
um, page. There is a history that has happened. You cannot just say it doesn't exist. You need to actually honour it and work with it, and this and, uh, over over time, and then path dependence because we know that, for example, when a certain pattern is established, very often some uh, positive feedback that pattern is constantly reinforced. Um, there are very good things about that, but there are also some negative things about path dependence. So the point is, if we understand these characteristics, we can work with them. We can facilitate them, we don't block them, because what we often see is that inadvertently we actually block these characteristics that all organizations have as complex evolving systems. The main thing, of course, is the creation of new order, the creation of the new, the creation of new ways of working, new ways of relating. This is something we are very, very good at. And yet we often, we often constrain it. And that is what we really need to, to facilitate and, and open up. What I've got on the left is some of the theories that I have um, worked with, some of the people I have worked with and uh, that, that have um, pro fed into uh, identifying these. These are not, this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. These are simply 10 that I have identified as being key. There are a lot more, and I think you know, all of you have, that are working with complexity can probably add another list um, to this. Okay, and if you want to read about the 10 principles, advert book at the back. <laughs> um, um, okay, this is the integrated methodology. We've talked about the semi-structured interviews. Um, now, we did 44 with Rolls-Royce Marine and 22 with the Modernization Agency. Uh, then we, we validated through the Reflect Back workshops, we do uh, the landscape of the mind, and in both cases it was approximately 70, wasn't it, yes. in both okay. cases? But we also do agent-based models and simulations. I will go through those in greater detail in a moment. What I want to show you here is the numbers. Do you see how we start with relatively small numbers, then we gradually increase using the different tools. So you have um, an expanding population, a nesting of that population. So you cannot come back and say, but you only interviewed X number within such a large organization. Part of the answer, by the way, also is we do not see individuals um, that we interview as um, just a, a statistical sample. We see them much for more as fractal representatives. They are a microcosm of the whole organization. They actually can reflect very much the whole. And uh, particularly if we take a very good cross-section across the organization. And in another of our business partners, for example, um, we went right from the secretaries right through to the managing director, right across, right through. So that is very, very in, important. Also the visual representation um, and the complexity thinking workshops. And, and the main thing that I, a point that I did this morning was to make out that we always use non-attributable data. We, it's astonishing how much sensitive information people actually volunteer. Uh, and it's very, very important that we always honor um, that and everything is non-attributable. Okay, um, this is something that uh, came through this morning, so I will go through um, very quickly, but there's something that I think was, is, is important. Um, and one of the issues is very often an organization will come to us with an impression of what the problem is. Invariably, that is not the real deep underlying problem. It is, it is the most obvious um, symptom of the problem. In this case, um, it, it happened to be, because they were struggling with it for two years, that it was cultural differences that were the main, um, the main issue. What we found, first of all from, um, from LOM and then from the interviews, that was not the case, and I think it was the evidence that we had that they said, hold on a minute, don't spend 
so much time, so much effort, so much energy in that one issue. There are other things that are very, very important. If you don't um, actually face those, if you don't acknowledge those, uh, you know, things, things might go wrong. Um, so that is, um, I, I think, very, very important in, in, in that the initial problem very often is not. And as, as, as um, Terry has already told you, these are where the two key issues. So what we in fact had was the natural experiment uh, was the volunteer, was the Rolls-Royce Marine, and the focus of the study were the two issues. And we had the 16 volunteers, they were guided on interview technique, um, we co-evolved, etc. I think we've gone through all that, and I think we've gone through all that as well. Now, the thing that you don't know about, and not even Terry knew about until I told him <laughs> at the break, is that the agent-based modeling that we have done, um, the, the, the results have just come through. Um, and I will tell you about that in a moment. And again, with the MA project, there was quite a considerable um, difference, and I think that, 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 um, that was covered very well by Caroline. Okay. And this is what we did with the, with the, um, MA, with the MA project. Um, it, um, right. What I'd like to do now is just to spend a few minutes on each of the tools because, um, and then you can come back and, and, and please don't wait until the end of the presentation if you have, if you have questions. Um, what we do with the semi-structured interviews we only use eight questions, and sometimes we may not actually even go through the eight. I have done interviews where I have only asked the first question for one and a half hours, and that was more than enough. Uh, because what we don't look for is, in that kind of thing, this is a very positive thing, we don't go for facts and figures, we try to understand the depth the issues that, I, that, that these people are concerned with, what is actually exercising them, why it is that they feel so strongly about it. So the questions are mainly trigger questions. Um, and the key here is the listening. Listening very, very carefully, because what you hear in between the lines is sometimes more important than what people actually say to you. Um, and when we do the analysis, we try to identify the common themes. These are the things that m everyone sort of um, mentions. The dilemmas. Dilemmas are very interesting because dilemmas are either or questions. Uh, and they're seen as equally desirable objectives that apparently cannot be achieved at the same time. When you look at dilemmas and turn them around and ask, why not both and? Why does it have to be either or? What would be the implications, the consequences of actually looking at it from a both and perspective? And that opens up the, again, uh, the, the, that exploration of, of the possibilities. And then they reflect back workshops, obviously, to validate the findings <coughs> and to use as a starting point for the, the work that comes next in identifying the conditions to build the framework. Okay, the agent-based model, now this is very interesting, the agent-based model, um, how many are familiar with agent-based models? Just so that I know, okay, okay. Um, these are, these are models that can actually map individual heterogeneous agents. These are not averages. We are actually looking at <coughs> individuals. And, each, and, and they are based on an email questionnaire. So this is the data that is provided by individuals to an email questionnaire. So each agent is a specific individual. And very much we are looking at some of the things that Yasi this, said this morning about network. But what is very important here is that we can ask different sets of questions and identify different types of network. 
For example, what is the social network? What is the work network? What is the political network? What are the different networks? But if you, a very simple question. If you were on holiday for two, three weeks and you come back to the office, who could you go to to find out about what's been happening at work, what's been happening socially, what's been happening, uh, you know, whatever. If you have a bright idea, who would you take it to? If you have a technical problem, who would you go to? Do you see how, how you then build and, you know, the network? But the network is the, the each individual actually identify who it is that they would go to. So we have interconnected networks. Um, now, one of the interesting things, and I was talking with, with Terry um, earlier, we haven't done the full analysis here because it's only just come back from um, our modeling expert. We, we, we have a, an international team and our modeling expert is actually based in, in, in Turkey, while the NetMap expert is based in Australia and so on. So, so um, we're not just based in, in, in the UK. What was interesting was the viral infection of ideas. You start off with an individual to see if how far <coughs> would the sharing of that idea permeate through that network? And lo and behold, although you would expect that it would go right through the entire network, it doesn't. It stops with those that are not well connected. It actually stops dead. It, it's quite remarkable. Um, it, it, it's, it, so this is something that we will now see together and explore further and find out, you know, what is it that, can be, that we can do to actually facilitate the, in, the connectivity, the, the networking and so on, if that is an issue. Um, so that is what the, we do. So what we do with the, um, the um, model, we, we, we build it into a simulation and we, we can then also do a lot of what-if questions. For example, if you were to take away this particular um, uh, individual or this group of individuals and you want to do some restructuring, what would it look like? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's in a way, a safe way to do um, these, these, these what-ifs. Sorry, can I just ask, um, yeah. how do you know, in practical terms, where the viral infection stops? What are you doing to determine that? Because you can see the f if, if someone is not connected to someone else, so th the idea would come through from the person giving you the idea. If you are not very well connected with others, it would stop with you because you will not want to then share it. How do you know that's not been transmitted? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the question there is, so you've gone through this, you're very familiar with what's going on. What's happening in practical terms whereby you know that? things are going to other people and the information is being taken on board and in other cases it isn't. It isn't. That sounds as if you're actually monitoring this content. No, we're not monitoring it. We've asked them a question. We've asked them, you know, who would you go to in those circumstances? So they have answered those questions. It, it, was, it was their answers that gave us the fact that they are not connected in that kind of context. They may be very well connected in a different context. That's why I'm saying there are different networks within any organization. Um, so in one particular context, it may not go through. In another context, it may. Um, that's why one particular tool is never enough, never enough. And with NetMap, you saw a little bit about the NetMap, and that is what a high-level um, map looks like, um, and, and, um, and, and then we can go right into all the other ones. And these are some of the things that, that, that NetMap actually um, does, and I think it's a lot of the things that Yasir actually told us this morning about emerging communities of practice, the movers and shakers, the social network flow of communication. It, it, it will be a whole afternoon on the 16th, so, so we can go into it into much greater. Um, now, we also use pictures. Um, and this is, this is, let me show you uh, what a picture might look like. We have a, a resident artist and um, he will listen either to a discussion or some, very often when we're doing the analysis of the findings. He was, now in this one, he sat in the analysis of one of our business partners, not present. <laughs> 
Um, and what, what was happening, um, first of all, what does a picture do? It can actually capture several things at the same time. It's a lot easier to actually see several things at the same time than, than, than keep them in text or in any other way. So it does want... But the other thing which is very important is that we can deal with exceedingly sensitive issues. In this particular organization, um, as you can see, they were uh, frantic in actually trying to go through different initiatives. Um, they um, almost had redefined the word prioritization. I don't know what it means to you, but to me, to prioritize something means I put it in order of priority, one, two, three, four. In this case, prioritization meant everything was priority one. And they really, as you can see, I mean, he captured it beautifully. I mean, they were really trying to keep those plates uh, twirling while the entire edifice was falling apart because they were working incredible hours. Uh, you know, they simply did not have enough time or energy to look at other things except how do they actually fulfill these priorities. Now, this isn't something you can actually talk to people very easily cold. You show the picture, sort of shock of silence, then they recognize it, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, a slight smile, perhaps even a, a light laugh, it breaks the tension, then you can address it, you can face it, you can talk about it. And, and this is, this is how, how we use it. Uh, so just to go back, um, it captures a multiplicity of issues, it can show very sensitive challenges, and it also acts as a catalyst for, for generative dialogue, because Julie and Burton can actually use, uh, he, uh, for example, when we were doing work with Shell, they invited him to work with their, um, on the strategy team, uh, so that they, he captured the picture, and then uh, after what he heard, and they're very naive, these pictures, and that's part of their power, because this is what comes over, this is what, what, what you're saying, that others um, uh, understand, and then it, it opens up to the discussion beautifully. Now, I will now invite um, Melissa to just take us through um, the, these are, this is the second set of interviews that Melissa did with the interviewees. Do you want to start? You just press the... Okay, so hi, my name is Melissa Lemus, and amongst other things, I'm actually a research officer on the IPAS project. Um, so basically, after we went through the process with Rolls-Royce of the whole project, it's um, very nice to talk about how great things are and how great we do them, but it's also very good to go back and look at um, what actually happened. And in the same way that companies went through the research process so that they don't make intuitive decisions, as Terry was talking about, it's also important for us as a project and in light of the research not to make intuitive um, uh, assumptions about what we do. So this was the, um, the reason for the evaluative interviews and we briefly just looked at five areas. So that was process, um, participation, why people took part, um, what improvements we could make in the future, what learning there was and whether there was any continuity after the project. Um, and these interviews took place with the uh, 14 members of the Accelerated um, Leadership Development Program who were working with us. So just, this is just very sort of top-line uh, findings, which also helps us think a little bit more about the um, project. So this is, um, yeah, most of the leadership, uh, learning and development projects usually take place out of context. So you'd, um, you take a group of people, you take them to a training centre or um, so to, to work on a specific area. What was identified by the people who were involved in the ARD was that actually this pro project had a high level of interactivity. And this links to the next thing about participation, that um, apart from finding out why people took part, we also found out that um, the reason that it did have a high level of interactivity was because you're actually interlocking individual development with the real organizational problems. So you're actually doing the training in context and not out of context. Um, enablers, uh, this had to do um, things that people said was the approach, so the way the whole project was structured. Um, support, mainly from people like Les um, and Terry, the, the key sponsors, as well as from ourselves when it was needed. And also um, a certain amount of flexibility which allowed people to have a structure, but also when they saw that the structure potentially wasn't working 
for reasons of time or uh, resource, that they could actually adapt it without ruining um, the, the cohesion that we had going as a project. Um, inhibitors, the usual suspects, time, money, busy diaries. Um, we just tried to get around this. I mean, there's not much I think we can do about that. Um, also, improvements. Uh, feedback was one of the things that people said, and our feedback was given, and mainly in the form that we do usually give feedback, but it's usually, um, oh, you know, good job or whatever. But this sort of project is um, more like an investment, so in the same way that we kind of um, put our money in the bank and we want to know what the bank's done with it, it's very similar with this sort of pro project. It's an investment of time, it's an emotional investment, it's a career development project. So it's a lot of things going on there, and people want to know that um, over a course of time what's actually happened. So this is what is meant by feedback. Um, uh, learning. Yeah, and this is, this is actually something that one of the um, ALD members said, which I thought was quite nice, that um, for him, and this kind of captured also what other people were saying, that um, for him, the project, he learned that awareness that even that in a huge organization with huge potential, there's always room for improvement. So there's always room to strive forward and make things um, better. Um, and finally, in terms of uh, continuity, what we found that in some cases that the project has sort of started, fostered like maybe networks, and I mean this just in terms of social contact with other people, So, or it also acted as a shared uh, memory or resource to talk about in future situations where maybe you're kind of the in a room of strangers and it's like, oh, you know about this project and it's, you get a sort of uh, rapport going. Um, and also, uh, in terms of the, the programs and the recommendations that eventually a lot of these things have been embedded into the organisational practice. So now when we talk about the ICOS project, it's, it's sort of already part of the organisation, so almost like it, it happened, but it's kind of being embedded. So, and that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that embedding, I think, it's, it's very, very important. Um, okay, we also um, introduced Partners to Complexity Thinking workshops. Uh, and in fact, we are about to have one on the 10th of June with the Modernization Agency, where we, we use the theory to actually talk about very practical issues. So it isn't just, here's the theory, go away and do what you will with it, but how can we actually apply it in your day-to-day -day work? Um, and the beauty of doing this after we've done the research and so on is we can actually use examples from uh, their particular context because that is what makes it accessible. Uh, not just talking about exploration of the space of possibilities, but talking what does it mean in, that, in their particular um, uh, context. Um, okay, what's the object of the integrated methodology? It helps to embed good working practices. If we were to just do it and walk away, frankly, I would not consider that as a success. It doesn't matter how much it was appreciated in the short term. If, it does, if something does not continue, and as, 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 as Melissa said, things are continuing, I think Terry already said this morning, things are happening after um, we have finished, um, then that is the, that is the real um, contribution and benefit. Um, and if it helps to develop that capacity to co-evolve with the changing environment, that would also be an absolutely huge benefit, so that we don't have to keep going through major restructuring. That is why some you know, people need to understand the logic of complexity. What is it that it means in your day-to-day -day work? Once you've understood that logic, you don't have to go into the science and, and the background, but what does it mean in your particular case? Then how do you work it? Then that, 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 that is the, um, uh, the, main, the main point there. And of course, the, the whole obvious point is to make, help organizations become fitter um, and more competitive. You can still talk about being competitive. Why so many tools? I think, I hope that you've got a sense that the one supports the other. They are complementary. That one in it by itself is never enough. 
so that what we understand the, from, from the interviews can be you know, supported by law, and then again, what we find in the agent-based model cannot stand by itself without understanding the deeper cultural issues uh, from the interviews and so on. So they triangulate the data and provide robust and rigorous findings, and that is, I think, what both of these organizations find. That is what makes it actually uh, both coherent and persuasive. Um, and they offer a very rich and deep understanding of the organization to itself. I think um, that you will agree, I hope in both cases, that what we found, I mean, when we walked out of that two-day um, workshop, I think there was, there was a very, very deep understanding that otherwise it would simply not have been there. And particularly for the ALD team, for example, it helped them to understand the business in a depth that they would not have had the opportunity unless they, even if they had worked with it, they still would not have had that particular perspective. And I hope that the same will also happen um, with, with the modernization agency. And then finally, we can use those findings, those very rich, very deep findings, to build um, the, and co-create the enabling um, framework. Um, and I've already said how we do it. We use a core team, we identify the different conditions, but the point is it's not a one-off process. It can never be a one-off process. As you all know, when you've gone through change processes, um, it, it, is, it is ongoing. If we talk about complex evolving systems, in fact, they're complex co-evolving systems or organizations. This thing has to continue. That is why taking the ideas, taking um, uh, you know, it into, into the culture is very, very important so that it can actually continue the process of co-evolutionary sustainability. Um, now, we've got five minutes for just a few questions. Tea is outside and we'll have a nice long break and then come back and spend an hour talking about all these ideas and, and, and also with, with our other speakers. So, any sort of burning questions at, at this point? I've got one. Do you want to sit No, go ahead. Um, I'm just interested in the, the, the principles behind complexity or that's yes. sort of self yes. Um When organisations go through change, they usually have some kind of goal already of what they want to become. Yes. So I'm just wondering how you reconcile that. Okay. There, in, in, there's nothing contradictory about having a direction and bringing in self-organization and emergence and so on. Because you can have a vision, a direction of where you want to go. How do you best get there? Uh, but the, the, what it does say, though, is don't make that vision become set in stone. It's something that is pulling you along while you're going. Uh, by facilitating self-organization, emergence, co-evolution, and so on. It will help you achieve it better, but what will happen while you're going through that process is it may show you that your direction may need to be different. So that's the other thing it, it, it actually shows. 